Well, good day, everybody. This is Chris back again at the Ancient Scholar. And here I have uh, the Delta 9 THC molecule back up, and we will continue our discussion about the cannabinoids. Uh, we'll talk about the receptors that these molecules act as a ligand for, uh, with uh, the understanding that the phenolic group here, this phenolic group, the benzene ring, the hydroxyl uh, group, uh, tends to um, have a significant amount of activity. So this, this molecule acts as a ligand for the cannabinoid receptors, which are um, G-protein coupled receptors, but they work a little differently than a lot of G-protein coupled receptors. Um, a lot of your, your G-protein coupled receptors, uh, when they um, are acted upon, uh, they um, activate uh, adenyl cyclase, and adenyl cyclase catalyzes the conversion of adenosine triphosphate uh, into uh, cyclic uh, three prime five prime adenosine monophosphate or CAMP and, and CAMP acts as an intracellular uh, messenger secondary messenger uh, messenger intracellular signaling molecule. Um, the cannabinoid receptors, when acted upon, um, tend to do some different things, and in fact, uh, they can actually have um, adenyl cyclase can be inhibited. And you can kind of have some inhibition occurring. And you have some really interesting things occurring um, with the um, signaling process. You have uh, uh, particularly um, a couple of different channels. You have uh, potassium channels and calcium channels um, in addition to uh, some interaction with protein kinase A and protein kinase C and some other, other um, channels as well, but primarily potassium and um, calcium channels. Um, so it's, it's a pretty complicated uh, picture that results from um, all this stuff going on. Um, so we don't know exactly. We don't have a well-defined understanding of the exact mechanism. Um, it does tend to be complicated. It involves multiple ion channels and proteins. Uh, but what we do know is that this, this does um, lead to a overall modulation of multiple neurotransmitters. Um, uh, you can have some inhibition of the release of multiple neurotransmitters in um, a very certain areas of the brain. Um, you can have interactions in the hippocampus, the, uh, the cerebral cortex, and um, the, uh, the dopamine-activated um, uh, uh, pleasure reward uh, pathways. You have a lot of, of complicated processes occurring there. Um, when these uh, CB1, uh, specifically the CB1 receptors, are located in the central nervous system, the CB2 receptors are located in the peripheral nervous system, and activation of them uh, tends to lead to um, immune system modulation, and, and it does appear that um, THC or the cannabinoids. Um, may cause some immunosuppression um, or may have some immunosuppressive actions. But the, the overall effects um, are, are a little inhibitory and um, THC can kind of, um, can kind of um, create uh, some rather mild, for the most part, mild uh, signs and symptoms uh, of euphoria, a dulled sense of time, a slowed reaction time, times um, some overall happiness. There are some uh, some negative effects associated with that. As far as um, uh, people may um, feel suspicious, um, they can get real hungry, um, and um, there is there is some debate as to the, the exact abuse potential of it. There there does appear to be a a, a documented um, withdrawal pattern, but it, it tends to be uh, pretty mild in most cases from the the literature I've seen. Um, and uh, when we look at um, using uh, cannabinoids, there does appear to be pretty pretty quick down regulation and tolerance that builds up so people may have to use more and more of uh, the, the whatever cannabinoid they're using to get the same effect. So there is some tolerance that builds up um, there. So uh, there, there are at least some, some mechanisms that, that may um, lead to some sort of dependence that, that, that could develop, but um, it's certainly not 
um, on on par with some of the other um, substances. Uh, certainly not nothing like ethanol or um, when you uh, withdraw from alcohol. Uh, there are recognized medicinal benefits uh, to the cannabinoids. They um, are, are good at uh, decreasing uh, nausea, particularly in people uh, that are receiving chemotherapy for cancer. Uh, they can increase appetite in cancer in patients that have uh, HIV, and, and there may be even a role for THC in um, chronic pain. It may help people with chronic pain, and it's been shown that it may decrease intraocular pressure, so uh, people that have... Uh, problems with elevated um, intraocular um, pressure, like glaucoma, may benefit from uh, the cannabinoids as well. Um, when it comes to talking about the, the, the safety of the cannabinoids, um, the cannabinoids are exceptionally safe. Um, the, 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 it's pretty darn hard to o overdose on the cannabinoids, to, to ingest or to to um, get enough of, well, in this case, the THC, get enough of that into your system to, to kill you. Um, they're, they're pretty exceptionally safe when it comes to that. Um, really, the big safety concern, um, looking at the literature, is that when you smoke, any anytime you smoke and you have smoke going out of your lungs, you, you do have an increased risk for uh, lung cancer. Um, so that, that may be a concern. Um, but the overall safety of the, the of the of the cannabinoid itself tends to be pretty high. Obviously, it can compare um, if you're you're around heavy machinery or you're doing very delicate tasks where um, they're they're dangerous. Obviously, that may be a different story. And there is some evidence that suggests that this may may have some effects in the uh, developing um, adolescent brain. So there may be some some concerns there, but again, um, in the in the grand scheme of things, uh, the cannabinoids really do appear to be uh, very safe um, as far as uh, substances that you may use, the people that may use um, and abuse. But with that said, I think it's important to talk about it, talk a little bit about the chemical structure. Um, and talk a little bit about the biological basis of it, because there actually is some very complicated physiology that's going on there, uh, some of which we don't understand all that well. Okay, guys, I'm going to go ahead and cut it off here. This was a uh, series of videos covering the uh, cannabinoids, and we just happened to show you uh, the representative molecule from that, uh, which is uh, Delta-9-THC. Uh, Oh, um, and, and in closing, I should say that um, it is possible that if you um, are, are smoking uh, marijuana that's very low, perhaps in, in the, the active molecule, and you have some other cannabinoid-like molecule that has less action, you may actually still experience intoxicating effects because the uh, actual smoking um, process can uh, change can convert um, some of the uh, cannabinoids into more active forms like, like Delta-9 THC. Um, so that's just uh, something noteworthy. Um, when we run uh, drug tests, often there are uh, metabolites, very common metabolites of this that we, we can look at and they can stay in the urine for up to a couple of weeks, uh, you know, 12 days to even um, several weeks if somebody uses it chronically and um, in large amounts. Okay, now I'm going to cut it off, guys. Uh, so that was an introduction to the molecular structure and the physiological basis of the cannabinoid molecules. As always, thanks for hanging in there.